Hello everyone and welcome to JFG tonight. What an important week uh, with Tim Cast inviting Kanye, Kanye walking out. Quite a fascinating interaction, very subtle one. And I want to review the full uh, interview up to the moment where Kanye walks out because I think there's much important things happening. I think it's a build up that leads to Kanye leaving. Uh, at first, on the first watch, not knowing the whole context of the interview, I had the impression that Kanye was walking out very early on very little pushback. But it was a list of subtle um, things that Tim did, which are breaches of the etiquette of interviewers, which I think had already built to Kanye deciding to leave very early in this interview because Tim Cass didn't give the proper respect to a guest. Um, starting with the introduction, Tim, Tim Poole starts by telling Kanye, do you want to introduce yourself? It's like, bro, uh, this is your most important interview and you're going to drop it on your guest to, be, to have the responsibility to introduce himself. And, you know, it's Kanye, it's Ye, he doesn't need to introduce himself. Normally, what you do as an interviewer is you, you pull the best presentation of the person, even if you want to destroy him after, even if you disagree. There must be a reason why Ye deserves to be invited on Tim Cast. So you cannot, you, you, you cannot treat him like he's uninvited. There has to be some positive to be said that you can say about him that justifies you inviting him, and then you can disagree with everything he says. That was very poorly made by Tim Poole, and ultimately what we see is a lack of empathy that makes a very good interviewer. Tim Poole doesn't have it. Tim Poole is too disconnected. He's too much of a newsman to be a good interviewer. And at some point, you have to leave aside the news and acknowledge that you are the news. If you have Kanye West on your show, you can be the news. And that's so much better than talking about the news, which is all Tim Cast wanted to do. Tim Cast, in other words, didn't have the proper... Uh, the proper perspective entering this interview didn't have the respect that this was, this is something that will build your show forever. I mean, your show could have become a classic yesterday, could have become so much bigger. Uh, you, you need to jump on that opportunity and be thankful for it, even if you, you will disagree ideologically later. Uh, there, there's also the very last moment, and we'll, we'll review the whole thing. Uh, because I think there's much commenting I have to say on, on various sentences that were thrown here and there that build the tension. But Tim Poole at the end uh, started attacking on anti-Semitism, but at the same time claiming he didn't want to talk about anti-Semitism yet. But you cannot drop that word like this and and hope that uh, it's going to be okay, the guests will ignore it. It's an attack that needs to be addressed. So if you bring the anti-Semitism word, then everything else stops. And I need to talk to you about the word that you just said, and I need to defend myself. That's Kanye. Th that's the position that Kanye was put in. And it's an unfair position, especially if you've been coached before to say, oh, we want to talk mostly about the news, and then we'll talk about the anti-Semitism stuff in the offline show. If you, if you want that, you can ask that to a guest. That is a viable... You can explain to a guest, look, I have too much fear with the YouTube rules and everything. Let's keep it on the offline part of the show. But then don't bring the word anti-Semitism in your first analysis of the news, because then he has to go through it all. Uh, Geo Bro says, the situation glows to high heaven. I can't imagine why it's being taken seriously. Yeah, I mean, it is... Uh, <coughs> it is... Uh, it is weird also how Tim Pool brought the fact that he has Jewish employees who go to Israel. And that is a reason why you need to fight back on Kanye. Uh, Tim Poole looks like more than ever before. Tim Cast looked yesterday like a CIA outpost. 
Doubting Thomas says, Jeff, you accuse Tim Pool of being normally late on the news, but in this case, he was quite fast, even faster than Jeff. Not true. I mean, you, you can credit Tim for having Kanye as a guest, but I've been talking about the Kanye stuff on an everyday basis since the last two weeks. Tim Pool didn't talk about Kanye on an everyday basis for the last two weeks. Nicholas Petris says, we need JF, Ye, Furentes, and Milo have a chat. That would be great. I wrote in DM to Milo uh, on Gab. He hasn't answered yet, but maybe he's going to get to it at some point. Because yesterday, I, you know, I've been, I've been very critical of Milo in this whole thing. And I'm not sure we should have any confidence in him. But I think yesterday I understood a little more about his inner motivation. And I understood that he's on a path of vengeance and destruction. And I have come to respect what Milo is putting together here. Uh, and, you know, with all reserves and knowing that it's going to crumble at some point, this whole thing, and that knowing that Kanye is not becoming the next president, let's not deceive ourselves. But I have understood that there is a legitimate path of vengeance here for Milo, a path of vengeance against everyone, against the Republicans, against Trump. And I think if you understand this, then his destructive endeavor is respectable. There is something to be had here. And that thing may be simply to crash the Republican Party or crash Trump, which Kanye says it's not his goal. So already here we have a tension between Milo and Kanye. I think that I prefer almost the... uh, Sorry, I prefer almost the perspective of Kanye here because I can respect vengeance and just absolute destruction. Kanye is kind of naively asking, how do I become a president? And he he doesn't want to hurt Trump, but Trump needs hurting. All right, let's get started. But before this, another amazing event that leads me to Review my own hate of certain people. Nick Ferrantes was featured on Jimmy Kimmel, national TV, and it's fucking art. It is art. This is absolute beauty. But I think this more than anything sums this gentleman up. What, people calling me gay because I've never had a girlfriend? I think if anything, if anything, it makes me less gay. Never having a girlfriend, never having sex with a woman, really makes you more heterosexual. Because honestly, dating women is gay. (laughs) Having sex with women is gay. And having sex with men is gay. And, and, you know, it's really, it's all gay. (laughs) (laughs) That was the Christmas episode, by the way. (laughs) Uh, I would have never thought I would see... Nick Fuentes memeing and the normies of Jimmy Kimmel laughing at it. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, Congratulations to Nick. This is so beautiful and there's so much to say about this. On what degree of humor are these normies laughing? I don't even know. Are they laughing because they think Nick is not being sarcastic, not laughing at it all? This was a funny intervention by Nick, and it it gets the attention it deserves. But where are we in the Joker movie? Like, Because in the Joker movie, the showing of the clip of the jokes of the Joker are laughed at by the audience, and the host is is having the audience laugh at the Joker rather than at the joke. But at the same time, the joke has some humorous quality to it. And I think we're exactly in the same position here. Uh, Vadet says they are laughing because the laugh sign lit up. Yeah, that's unfortunately what it is. But I mean, I'm sure there are intelligent people in that audience that are understanding that Nick was being comedic here. And so 
in a way, it's all good that it's shown and that it makes people laugh because it was funny, this whole dating woman is gay. And there's even a deep point to it, which is that uh, what Nick is talking about is not so far from the truth. He's he's saying that living the, the cock carousel lifestyle or the, the pussy carousel lifestyle is not it comes from gay culture in many ways and it's not a desirable life that is beautiful and so uh P- cosmic nut says they are laughing at him that's what they seem to be doing perhaps under the pretense of oh here's another one of these conservative secretly gay people who who uh who try to who are so anti-gay that they become anti-hetero and anti-themselves in the process. I don't know. The the levels of humor here are quite uncomfortable, and I love it. I love that uh, the normies are confronted with that kind of humor. Anyways, good job to Nick, even if I I love to hate Nick. uh, You have to give it to him here. Absolute art to have elevated such a talking point of a subtlety because it's about promiscuity. It's about, uh, is it good that in our society we are encouraging young people to rotate across relationships? And bang, right there on Jimmy Kimmel. Absolutely beautiful. If you would like to support the show, use the dollar button under the Odyssey chat. Odyssey super chats are my favorite way to receive support for the show. Don't forget to add a payment method in your Odyssey account if you'd like to send super chats. Alternatively, you can also use Entropy. The link to Entropy is in the description below. I'm still coughing quite a lot. But my voice is performing well, so I think I should be able to do my full review of this fantastic, extremely subtle failure of an interaction, uh, which I, I, I tend toward Tim Pool is responsible here. And that was not my first judgment. Of course, the narcissism, narcissism of uh, Kanye is playing here a little bit, he's a little bit annoying, a little bit too dominant, a little bit rambling. But as an interviewer, your job is never let your emotions take take over, never let the insults of your guest take over. You have to squeeze the guest to get the best juice out of him. And Tim Pool fail at doing this. So I, I say it's a fail for Tim here. And a fail of empathy, a fail of, uh, we'll see, empathizing with the position. All right, okay, we have a guy here who's almost been put in jail, or at least believes he has almost been put in jail, who has certainly been threatened with psychiatric interventions of the kind that would make him a vegetable. Uh, this requires more from an empathic perspective from an interviewer than what Tim did. Tim says, I think they, they were unfair to you. Uh, that is a, that is an understatement, Tim. Tim. It's not, I think they were unfair to you. You're just taking the, the, the most superficial layer of the suffering of Kanye here. They were unfair to you. You say that to someone who got insulted by someone or got lied about maybe once. Kanye West uh, has been threatened to lose his liberty. All of his liberties. Britney Spears style. And they, they have taken enormous amounts of effort to make it happen and possibly to put, it, to put him in jail according to his own testimony of yesterday so saying oh they were unfair to you is so reductive it's like you didn't hear what he just said doubting thomas says jf no tim was faster this time tim was so fast on the story of kanye leaving the podcast that he was nearly instantaneous whereas it took you almost 24 hours (laughs) 
what the fuck are you talking about? Yesterday when I closed the show, I said, let's go watch Tim. And so I was with you guys watching it live as it happens. I was on the news as it was happening. What are you talking about? Everybody knows who you are. And uh, which uh, you gentlemen would like to introduce yourself? Nicholas, please. Hi. Yeah, I'm... Uh... So, oh, I missed the part where he says to Ye, do you want to introduce yourself? Keep that a little bit vague so that they can answer to that and, and speak more to that. And then, of course, we're going to get into a lot of different issues. However, head over to TimCast.com and become a member. We're going to have a members only uncensored show, which will probably get a bit more in depth on a lot of other issues. So here he is Doug whistling to his audience. We're going to talk about the Jews after the podcast. But it doesn't seem like he has imposed this on Ye. So if you haven't imposed it on Ye, uh, don't be surprised if he brings it up. It seems that he has loosely mentioned to Ye, yeah, you know, I would like us to talk about the news. Okay, but the news currently is that Ye has some statements to make about Jewish power. That's the news. You cannot go around it. You cannot... If you want to go around it, you need to be super explicit and it needs to be clear between you, your audience, and Ye. Look, we all agree we're not going to talk about this, but disagreement didn't happen. And on top of it, if it had happened, Tim would be in total breach of it. Uh, that, I'll just leave it at that. TimCast.com, become a member, support our work, and we'll talk about more there. Smash the like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us, as I mentioned, is we have Ye himself. Would you like to introduce yourself, good sir? You did it. There you go. Absolutely insulting. If I'm Ye, I'm insulted here because I'm JF and I'm insulted. If I go to a random podcast that has five viewers and because I'm there, they get maybe to 30, 40, 50, uh, I'm giving my time freely. And the least amount of respect you should have is that you give me an intro. If you don't give me an intro, it's because either you hate me or you're stupid. Because if you invite me to a one-hour, two-hour discussion that I will give of my life, that will all be cashed in by you, uh, the least you can do is recognize there must be something in my life that I have done that makes me that interesting, that you want to talk, me about, you want to, talk to me for an hour or two. So what is it? Lay it out in an intro, Tim. Tim, you don't say to even a, a C-series e-celeb, please introduce yourself. You certainly don't do that to Kanye. Look at all my interviews, you always see, doesn't matter if the news were low this week, if the guest is not super interesting, I always frame the guest, unless I truly don't know who that is. That would be an exception here and there when, they, when a guest that I don't know shows up on that very day. But other than this, you go to my interviews with Richard, always an intro, always professionally written. Doesn't matter if the news is low that day or I don't have much to say anymore about the same guy again and again, I will pull something out. It's your responsibility, Tim. You go. <laughs> I think everybody knows who you are. And uh, which uh, you see, normally you say, if you really don't have an intro, you say something like, you don't need an introduction. But that is even pretty cheap. And Tim Pool comes with it after Ye has refused to introduce himself. So already, if I'm sitting in front of Tim Pool, I have hate and blood in my eyes. That's where Kanye is. Woman would like to introduce yourself? Nicholas, please. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Nick Fuentes, first time here on the TimCast. Thank you for having me. You don't ask Nick Fuentes to introduce himself. What the fuck are you doing, Tim? For me. Yeah, absolutely. What do you do? Oh. <laughs> uh, and you dare ask, what do you do? Uh, Tim, you're making the news here. These people deserve an invitation to Tim Pool. Therefore, you should know who they are. <laughs> I'm a live streamer. I uh, I do a show called America First on Cozy.tv. All right. And of course, Milo, you were here a couple weeks ago. Yes, I'm your best ever guest. <laughs> so we, we've been told that uh, the episode with you is one of the best podcasts ever. People really I, enjoyed I hearing you speak. I think that's accurate. Okay. Milo being this new reformed hit hero, uh, but can't keep uh, the fabulous in. And so 
he responds to the, your, we've been told that uh, the podcast with you was really great. He says, I think that's accurate. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This guy, even if he's, he's expressing himself much more in an introvert manner these days because he's trying to look at hero because of his old claim, the change, which I, I don't know to which extent Milo is truly hetero. I know that he's trying to remarket himself. I personally think that the amount of gay that was in Milo is just undiggable, certainly not on the space of a few years. Uh, if, there wa if he was just a little gay, maybe a year or two of hetero behavior could save him. But in the case of Milo, I think there was a multi-year, uh, there, there's, there must be a multi-year quarantine of some kind before I fully agree with declaring him a hero. Okay. Yeah. Well, Thanks thank, for coming thank, back. Thanks. I was wondering how I was going to uh, make it even more extraordinary the second time I visited, but I think I might have pulled it off. <laughs> Luke's here. <laughs> Total sausage fest tonight. Um, welcome. My name is Zukardowski of We Are... What the... You want to get... You want to get the feminist talking point in? What the fuck are you doing? This is your most important interview in life. This is, by wealth, probably the biggest guest you've ever had. And you feel the need to point out, oh my God, there's so many men. It's a male space. What the fuck? And it's like, this guy always has shirts that seem more edgy than they truly are. Oh, that's your big statement. Epstein didn't kill himself. That is your, oh, oh my God, that is edgy. Oh, Luke, I can understand why you're being banned from everything. Epstein didn't kill himself. This is Eric Weinstein levels of edgy. We are change.org. Today I'm wearing my Epstein didn't Epstein himself t-shirt, which you could get on the best political shirts.com. And I think we should be using that word a little bit more, just like, you know, this YouTube channel didn't Epstein itself. And if this YouTube channel is Epstein, we will be streaming on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, I started the t-shirt company after YouTube demonetized me. So the best political shirts.com because you guys buy it. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, Serge. And I am Serge.com. Pleasure, guys. Man, you have to look at atheism is unstoppable commenting on the hair of this guy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, atheism is unstoppable was saying, look, if you told me, hey, Devon, you can get hair. But the negative aspect of this is you're going to get those hair. <laughs> And atheism is unstoppable. It was like, no thanks, I'm good. <laughs> All right, and uh, I'll just pull up this story from the Hill, which is from. And here we go. If you want this whole arrangement that you kind of seem to want to keep the anti-Semitism stuff for after the show, for the offline version. Uh, don't you come and say, oh, I'm bringing up the hill here. And Pence says that Trump should apologize for talking to these unclean people we are talking to today. It's wrong to give an anti-Semite a seat at the table. So now you've just opened the Pandora box. You've opened the door. Now don't you complain to me, Tim, that Kanye has to defend himself against those accusations. You're, you're saying... You're saying this is uh, this is what people say about yeah here. Um, earlier today, at 5 p.m., Pence says Trump should apologize. It's wrong to give anti-Semite a seat at the table. This, of course, is related to a dinner that happened, and I I, I was wrong a little on the details. So, a dinner happened. Uh, Nick, you were there. Yay, you were there. So it was wrong because earlier he said that the dinner was somehow caused by Milo when Ye corrected him and said, no, no, that, that dinner was discussed even with Trump before I even knew about Milo. So apparently Milo, Milo only came in and brought Nick Fuentes in toward Ye, so, which led to Nick Fuentes being there. That would be the causal route. I didn't know, but it's good that we now know. But that's another thing that 
that adds to the annoyance of yeah it's like not only do you not give me an intro you get a basic fact wrong that you affirm as a journalist and i already have to correct you and we're just two minutes in there i just want to uh, start off by how did this dinner come to happen and and what happened I was talking to Trump for about a month. We had scheduled the dinner in October, and then he announced for president. He, he pushed the dinner back to November. Um, and I've been pulling together a campaign. And So Trump had delayed the dinner. And after I put up the, the DEF CON tweet, uh, a bunch of people that had been canceled like Alex Jones. I started getting in contact with other people that were now on the, you know, the inside of the matrix. And uh, Alex Jones pr producer said that Milo wanted to contact me. And so uh, Alex Jones producer is the reason we get this trio here. There was the previous bonding that occurred between gay Milo back in the days and uh, Nick Furantes, and there was some contact there when they were serving each other cookies and laughing in a fabulous manner, both of them. That was the link between Milo and Nick. And then we have a Alex Jones producer puts together Milo and Kanye, and this allows Milo to bring Nick Furantes and the trio. It's a glowception, says DK Shadow. <laughs> and here we are. So that's how you guys got in contact. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, originally. And, um, and then uh, I've suggested uh, um, that we bring in uh, Nicholas as an uh, as enormous extra brain firepower that he is. Um, he's the most extraordinarily brilliant uh, political commentator of his generation. Um, and he's... Uh, Milo here being complimentary, analytic. This is the new Milo, the hetero Milo. Being treated just about as badly as anybody, so I thought he deserved to be in the room too. So this is kind of bizarre. You don't deserve to be in a room because you're treated as bad as anybody, but I guess that if it's a discussion about Jewish power and the fact that Jewish power was abused in the case of Nick, okay, I get it. And... Um... That's, that's pretty much how we got together. So I have some questions about that, but let's we'll, we'll we'll get through the dinner portion of you know how exactly this happened, what went down. So this is how you get in contact, the three of you. How is it that Nick ends up invited to this dinner, and and what happened? <laughs> now that's interesting. We're actually going to learn something here. What I learned from this interview, and it's subtle, but it's in there. Basically, yeah, they don't want to impose Nick Fuentes on Trump. So Nick was there as a staff of Ye, and they were sitting separately. And then Ye will go see Trump and will say, hey, about the dinner, do you want us to go somewhere alone? Or do you want me to bring my friends? And Trump said, oh yeah, bring your friends. So that's how it happened. That's how, that's how Ye got the consent of Trump without proper information. That's very interesting. Well, he he was rolling with me. I was impressed with Nick, and I was like, just come to the dinner. And we had uh, Karen Giorno uh, pick us up from the airport. So the uh, media person of Trump, I believe in 2016, or she was part of the staff. And there was a lot of back and forth. There's another gentleman named Jamar Montgomery that was with us. It's a... Uh, He's an engineer at Boeing, and his... Who's it? I'm telling him just to... He, we should raise everyone's volume. Okay, cool. Here, a technical issue takes the attention of Kanye because he's like, why is Tim suddenly speaking to other people? Uh, perhaps not fully professional of Tim here to be operating the technical aspects, and it's not clear in Ye's head, is this being filmed? Are, are it's, it, it leads to a further feeling of unprofessionalism here for Ye. So he's been exposed to three cases, arguably, of unprofessionalism for le within less than five minutes. Um, 
And we sat there and it was like when Trump came in, we were, I said, do you want to sit alone? He's like, no, bring your friends in. So, so this is important. This is how Ye got the consent of Trump by essentially having Trump and Sis bring them in, bring them in. And of course, then it was Nick Fuentes. A big thing is like Trump had no idea who Nick Fuentes was. And but this whole I just I just got to go right to the heart of this. See, Kanye is looking at the screen here. So Kanye is looking at the wall. In big on the wall, there's an accusation. Kanye is an anti-Semite. Now, Tim, you cannot, uh, you're doing this. You are, you are showing to Kanye an article that says he's an anti-Semite. And so, of course, he has to bring it up. He's going to say, I have to talk about this word anti-Semite that is getting thrown around. Anti-Semite claim that's happening. This is something, if you read the definition, it, it says you can't claim that there's multiple people inside of banks or in media that are all Jewish or you're anti-Semitic. And that's the truth. So here, there's the question of, we, we, we've been exposed to this many times. Is the truth can the truth be racist? And it's very important because it plays on two definitions of racism. One, a traditional one, and one that is more an extension that the left had, has done recently, which expands the word to basically mean everything. So in a traditional conception of racism, you would have a caveat in the definition. It would be something like this. Racism is uh, a judgment applied to a group of people with prejudice. So there was the, uh, the caveat of the prejudice. And when there was the caveat of the prejudice, that meant you can still say a truth that applies to a group of people. We'll fly here in the studio. Uh, you, can still, you can still talk about a group, and you can talk about facts of that group. If you do it without prejudice, it's not racism. That was old definition of racism. The leftists have been fighting against this and redefining it. But if you included that caveat, it was barring a lot of scientific data gathering, judgments of all kind, but that were not grounded in prejudice. They were grounded in fact. And then fact was contrary to racism. That means something was either factual or it might be racism, but it couldn't be both. Now, we are in a totally different world, especially when we talk about anti-Semitism, because when, when leftists are telling you about their threshold to reach racism or anti-Semitism, they will basically say any sort of stereotyping, uh, any sort of stereotyping uh, around things that are often said about this group will be racism or will be anti-Semitism. And they will not have the caveat or distinction to say, except if it's true. Or except if it comes from something else than a psychological prejudice. For example, if it comes from science or a sociological observation. Now, as such, if you say something like uh, Jews are overrepresented in the Supreme Court or in the halls of power and in the media or in politics, you state something that is definitely true by any sociological measure, just observation, just data gathering. It, these statements are definitely true. The statement that most of politics is funded by Jews within the top 10 donors of both parties, you have an extreme overrepresentation of Jewish funds. That is true. But the left has been wanting to make it also anti Semitic, such that bringing these facts was a breach of some moral. And therefore, there are some truths that you shouldn't talk about. 
or if you talk about them, you should be punished or you should be seen as bringing truths that are in line with anti-Semitism or racism. That is why all of this is important and it's an important discussion. Tim doesn't quite register here what Kanye is saying, but that's what he's bringing up when he's saying, so you can be anti-Semitic while making a true statement? That is what he's raising. The equivocation between the two definitions of racism, the one that the, the left has successfully pushed onto people, and that's ultimately anti-truth. Rodina Sid says, Jews are statistically overrepresented is a group statement, but Tim can't say anything about that one particular group. Well, that, that is another thing. If you want me to prove that Tim Cast here has committed mistakes, let me give you my best argument here, because I've already argued that he's made some breaches of etiquette as an interviewer. But fundamentally, the message of Tim to, to Ye in this interview is to say, you are talking about the Jews as a group. I see individuals in there. I see that you've been hurt by these individuals, but you are being inexact or unfair or anti-Semitic when you say they, or when you say the Jews, when you talk about them as a group. Now, consider this. Suppose I come on Tim Cast, and I say six million Jews have been killed in the Holocaust. Uh, and I say, you know, they were killed. They were killed in the Holocaust. And it's a terrible thing, and we should never again. Hashtag never again. There is not a world in which Tim would come back to me and say, uh uh, JF, you have judged the Jews as a group here. What I see here is six million individuals who were individually killed, each for their reasons. But do not, please do not talk about six million Jews and don't say they were killed during the Holocaust. It's not they. It's a bunch of individuals who died in certain ways, each of them an individual story. That will never happen. And that is the ultimate asymmetry that the anti-racist and the centrist like Tim Pool are pushing to create a system of unilateral disarmament around the Jewish question. That is, you can collectivize the victimization of the Jews, but you cannot collectivize the wrongs that they could do. And in fact, you cannot even imply collectivization. Because I think that when Ye says they, I think we, we understand that he's talking about a subgroup of Jews that have acquired power in the American political system. That's who he's criticizing. It's not all the Jews, and I think no one is mistaken here. We all understand that the six million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust they were a subset of the Jews. It wasn't all of the Jews. Yet, Tim refuses to extrapolate and extend this understanding to when a critique comes to the Jews. And the fact that a group might be Jewish and in power in the media industry or in the politics, in politics, it may be relevant that they are Jewish without it meaning that it was all the Jews. And this jump that Tim Pool makes between, oh, well, you're talking about all the Jews. Well, is it possible to talk about the fact that their Jewishness may matter to the political discussion without it being all the Jews? Where is that space of freedom that I have to talk about a somewhat but not fully collectivized harm that is being made onto Western civilization. And how, how, how do you want me to be so clear, Tim, so that everyone understands I'm not saying all the Jews, but I'm saying that those people in power, that their Jewishness matters, 
it matters to them at least, and it should start to matter to us if we wanted to be clever about it. Like, it's the truth. What are we talking about? And what, 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 what library, what do you mean? You mean? I'm saying like, I've been labeled anti-Semite, right? So. And see, see the, the most generic question by Temple. Do you see what I just did? It, it, we're 40 minutes in my show. I just expanded on what Kanye said. And I gave it respect, and that's 30 minutes of me speaking about it. And this is important. And it was maybe not perfectly framed by, by Ye, but certainly understandable enough that Tim Pool could have elevated it, just like I did. I, I spoke about it for 30 minutes. And what I said was important. Why is Tim Pool coming back with, uh, uh, oh, wh what do you mean? What do you mean anti-Semitism uh, uh, anti has some truth in it? Well, what are you talking about? The most generic comeback, he hasn't understood a single word. He doesn't give a shit. That's bad interviewing practices. There's, there's different beliefs about our, our bloodlines, you know, like the documentary that Kyrie posted. And, and Kanye making a side reference to the theory that the blacks are the true Jews from the black Israelites. In general, America has been left ignorant and history has been changed. So when we start questioning things that question the indoctrination, then you immediately get, you know, um, you said debanked or de what did you say happened to you or demonetized, deplatformed? De yeah, demonized, demonetized, and what's so beautiful? So Kanye is not used to talk about these subjects that he has to grasp to the clown beside him to even get the word demonetization. That is so funny that he is so not used to talk about it that the word didn't come to him. Full about this time is everyone got to see what's really been happening. And now we can really understand, we can see that Ron Emanuel was right next to Obama and then Jared Kushner was right next to Trump. So he's talking here about the phenomenon of handlers and the fact that it doesn't make sense for a, for a country of liberty and of Suppose, supposedly democracy, that we elect someone like Trump only to see him being shortcutted by Jared Kushner and being told, you don't do this, you do this rather, that, that's better for us. Nonsense that a collectivized interest has access to our men in power that we, we are supposed to elect. Da -da. But so, you, so we're, we're, we're getting right into it, I guess, right? I was, I was hoping to go for the news first before we got into all of this stuff. Look at him. Look at Tim. You have confounded the news and the question of Jewish power, Tim. You've done it by bringing the Hill article right on Kanye's face, putting it right on the wall, and Kanye has no idea, is this being shown on screen? I mean, I see an accusation here on screen that I'm an anti-Semite. And you dare say, oh, you're bringing it up already? Uh, you did it, Tim. You did it from the start. Uh, I, think, I think the issue is, uh, one way to put it, is you're e expounding upon a localization issue that you've witnessed, right? Let, let, me, let me clarify. There are a handful of people that you see are Jewish in a certain place, and then you associate Judaism with the power, as a, whereas I view that as not relevant to it. Like, yeah, you're substantially more powerful than I am, but I don't view what you're doing as an issue of black people. So he wants to adopt the fully race blind positioning. Now that is a tall order. Uh, Ye's answer to this will be pretty good. Yeah, but have you ever heard the term the black vote? So it's okay to put us in one net, but it's not okay for me to put them in one net. Yeah, but I mean, that's the basic. And so he's, he's holding Tim by the balls here because earlier 
Tim told him, oh yeah, you'd be good for the black vote. Well, Tim, well, th- th- is there such a thing as the black vote? You've just collectivized a bunch of people. There, there are individual votes, right? You don't see race, Tim? Well, you see race pretty much any time it suits you. And when, you, when it's negative or when you don't want to hear about it, suddenly you complain that you don't want to see race. I, I, so the hypocrisy that people have been <laughs> have been thinking about and knowing about and realizing for decades, we were all wondering how this dam was going to break. Everybody in the country. Very insightful comment by Milo here. It's true that there's been a dam on this question, like retaining water, accumulating weight, and that it was going to flow one way or the other. Uh, you know. Back in the the days of cable TV, maybe you could contain a rise of discussion around Jewish power by simply not having it through the official channels. But when you liberate information and you give control to millions of individual creators like me, like Tim Pool, it's got to come out. You know, there, there's not going to be an issue not discussed country was wondering what what is the root of this hypocrisy why can people talk about white people a certain way why can't they talk about that group a certain way and uh, the, the, the most the, the the wretched and wicked and oppressive prevailing orthodoxy of uh, cancel culture well it turned out that the one thing that was going to break the dam was the biggest star in the world and it took the biggest star in the world to do it um uh, and 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 now the dam is broken so let me let, let me tell you my issue i i don't like identitarianism Are you guys i don't like identitarianism tim pool it's just that you are the, the poor child of identitarianism. You identify as a skater. You identify as all of the cultural influences that you push for and that you believe in. It's just that racially, you don't have a ground to have any identity because you are too mixed. So it's not so much that you don't like identitarianism, is that you don't you won't find anything for you in it yet it would be quite easy Tim, for tim pool to pass as white so it's really a blockade in tim pool's mind tim pool could decide to identify as white tomorrow morning and he might get some reaction here and there but mostly he could fully participate to society as a white man um but yeah, Tim Pool doesn't like identity because if he had an identity, he would probably be alone in that group. There's just not enough of his ethnicity to have a history, a civilization of Af Koreans, a a sense of Af Koreanness, a culture of Af Koreanness. You guys are familiar with what that is. Well, yeah, they started it, and I'm, they've been visiting sure, on us. I, the, the, We're when trying I, to break it. When I was asking you about running for uh, president, so Milo here was saying they started it. He's basically saying identitarianism starts with Jews, and this whole distinction from the society in which you live uh, dates much more for the Jews than it does for even us white people. That you you immediately said, well, you know, you'd be good for the black vote. And I said, is that because I'm black? No, not just because of that. So is that, are you doing the same? Yeah, and ultimately, he has a very good point to Tim here. That is something I won't see Tim answer very well. Um, if you just considering a black vote is walking over the principles that you claim to adhere to, Tim. Same thing. I didn't say that was the only reason. I said it was because you're personable to the common person, and you probably would do well with the black. You make up a you make up reasons, but the fact is you wouldn't use those reasons if Ye was white. You just you you would adopt another explanation. Uh, the fact is you think Ye would attract the black vote because he's black. There's nothing wrong with this. It makes absolute sense. Of course, a black person listening to Ye will grant a little more, will, will forget about the, the poorly formulated sentence and will focus on the good stuff. Of course, he's going to benefit from the benefit of the doubt from his own side.
I vote, absolutely. Just because I, I'm black? Because a lot of black people don't like me. Uh, of, of course. I think, uh, I think race plays a role in a lot of things, absolutely. And I think that... And here, Ye isn't going strong enough on Tim. He, he should point to the fact that he's being in contradiction with his own stated beliefs earlier that basically doesn't see race at all, only individuals. Well, you don't see just an individual in here, you see the meaning of his blackness for other black people. For I, I, think, I think the, I, the construct of race has really been forced upon us as just something for us to be woke about and just constantly talk about and use it as these like walls. But now, this is bizarre because we have we have Kanye, who's fully woke on the Jewish question, and yet he still carries the memes of his anti-racist leftism. And so he's like, <coughs> on the one hand, trying to defend a position that we must notice, we must notice the question of Jewish power, and on the other hand, he's like, I think that the whole idea of race is some play to, to, to put us against each other. That's a very far left talking point. Now, Tim Pool will catch him on this. But that's why you don't carry those contradictions. That's why, of course, Kanye is engaging in, in this kind of philosophical thinking from a very recent time. And so he hasn't fully understood that some of his old beliefs are now contradictory to what he's pushing for and Tim Pool will try to grab this one. But say, say the same thing about Judaism? So there you go. If race is an illusion that they have put onto our head so that we think about this and we obsess, then isn't it an illusion when you see all these people in power and you, you, you see them as Jews? Extremely well made by Tim, but at the same time, it, it, it's Kanye's fault here. He hasn't gone through the thinking that, hey, if it matters that they're Jews, you're not going to go and discredit the concept of race. You're going to have to defend it. Well, let's look at the facts of what I'm saying, though. If you say in this neighborhood where they gerrymander, there's this amount of time. So, hey, I wasn't doing that. I was just gerrymandering the lawyers and the Hollywood executives. <laughs> this is uh, extremely poorly explained by Ye. Ye has this stream of consciousness rambling type of talk. There's an idea in there, hidden in there. But he explains it very poorly. He's He's trying to say, well, if you guys are talking about gerrymandering on black populations, how is what I, when I talk about Hollywood, why don't you see it as me gerrymandering Hollywood? So he's trying to, to superimpose here a metaphorical comparison where if you accept gerrymandering, why don't you accept my, my own mental gerrymandering? But, I mean, it's barely understandable, but if you, if you really listen, listen to what he says, I think it's what he means. And the people at the bank that debanked me and then froze my accounts. You know, it's like we want to jump into protecting the idea that we can't put a net around something, right? But that's been my job as a producer to take, uh, you know, a Roy Ayer sample and put a James Brown drum and put it within a two two minute, three minute song. That's the. So this is a very important question and poorly framed by Kanye. Kanye says it's about putting a net around things. I think it's a little bit diminutive here to be calling it a net because people, people think, oh, well, this expression, a net around thing is rough. It's, it's like it's imperfect and everything. But Kanye says it's a little bit of my work. When I do music, that's what I do. I integrate one idea and another, and I, I put them together in a generalized form. The point that he's trying to make is extremely important. And here it goes well laid out by a thinker like me. The question is, are probabilistic truths truths? Or are things true? just if they are binary. Because there's a couple of things you can know in the universe, like 
there's currently a table in front of me. That's a binary truth. No one contests that this is subject to truthful analysis. But there is definitely another category of knowledge that is prob- probabilistic in nature. Um, you know, the statement, this coin will flip at 50% head and 50% tail, that is a probabilistic truth. Now, a lot of people falsely believe that because it's probabilistic, it is not truth. But it is true. And there is a fact about how many times you'll have to flip a coin so that you converge more and more toward 50-50. If you flip a coin three times, you're going to have 66% one side, 33% the other side, perhaps, or perhaps 100% one or, or the other. But there's also a truth to be said about this. See, what I said is truth. When I say if you flip a coin three times, you're either going to have 100% tail, 100% head, or you're going to have 66 of one and 33% of the other. That is true. And yet, it is not a binary truthful statement that can apply to any given flip of the coin. In other words, it's a, it's a meta statement about the system. But these meta statements, is basically all of life. There, there is very rarely something that you're going to be sure about. Uh, DK Shadow says, you're wrong, JF, there's the edge. Well, even if you wanted to include the edge, there would be a truth to be said about the edge, and there would be a fraction of uh, flips that it falls on. So, um, the questions of race are very often leading to probabilistic truths. Um, and, and that's the, the fact that the leftists, at least I don't know if they don't understand or they, they just have so much cognitive dissonance that they don't want to engage with the point at all, but the leftists will often present things that do not undermine the probabilistic statement, and they think that they got something. Like a leftist will come and say, I know this one black guy, he's very intelligent, what about him? And it's like, I know this coin flip that landed on head, what about this coin flip? Well, my, my meta statement about coin flips in general and how, how many percentage of the time will they end on one or the other is still true. Just like my judgment of a group of human beings it remains true. Even if you talk about a standout observation of yours, that is so important to explain to leftists, and it's what Kanye could have tried to explain to Tim, but Kanye doesn't have the pedagogical knowledge and willingness to do it well. But this is what should have been the discussion on Timcast yesterday. Tim, do you acknowledge that probabilistic judgment can be true? while not applying to all elements of a set? That is the question. The way I actually think, and that's the way I talk, and now this morning I found out that they were trying to put me in prison because what they did was, uh, I, put, I moved $140 million into uh, JP Morgan. And I said, hey, I wanna to talk to Jamie Dimon. Like, look at me, I'm just going in naive, you know, multi-billionaire, like may, maybe Jamie Dimon will let me in on some deal flow. Wrong. <laughs> and I'm just like... So here, Kanye is trying to open his art and come to Tim with an exclusive of sort because he hasn't talked about this anywhere else and he's claiming, uh, this morning I discovered they're trying to send me to jail. And there will be a further failure of Tim's empathy here, uh, of Tim's ability to say, oh, well, okay, that's big. Oh, I'm sorry. And wow, that that must be uh, quite terrible. Nothing like this will come out of the mouth of Tim, and that will be perhaps the drop that makes that uh, that makes the glass pour over. Like <laughs> banging my hands like, I want to meet with Jamie. And I start complaining online, and then they debank me 
for complaining. And so I'm, I'm about to get debanked. They're like, you need to go to Trump's, the bank, AXO, whatever, you got to go. And I'm like, I've been trying to buy my own bank for the longest. And then we figured out how to get my own bank. It's like 50 million, 75 million. So I'm about to buy my own bank. But then as they're about to take the money out, here comes Adidas with a $275 million bill for marketing funds that they agreed upon. Because I said to them, hey, I'm the marketing, give me the marketing fund, which proves by the response they got when they, you know, stole the designs and said, we're going to not call them Yeezys anymore. So this is what. So Adidas gave him 275 million. Now that they are out of the deal, they are char charging him back. They want the money back. That is the kind of thing that will create a tax event where even if you were to give back the money, it would have been in your account for a moment. You would owe super uh, high amounts of taxes on it. What I was already fighting Adidas for. So I'm fighting Gap, get out of Gap, fighting Adidas. And then I deal with this little bit of noise from, you know, Zionism from the fashion world where they use this plant named Gabby, who's obviously like some kind of CIA agent, knows nothing about fashion. So again, the rambling uh, style of delivery of Kanye is not helping him at all. Those are all super important subjects. He's claiming that there was a Gab woman, Gabby, uh, who was around his circles and who was posing as some kind of fashion industry expert, but based on how she was dressed, she clearly didn't know about fashion, he says. That is important, but how can he just delivers it in, in this kind of rambling fashion, unstructured. We don't get to have the evidence. We don't get to understand what was this CIA woman doing around you? What did she want? Uh, that is very poor. And I can understand, by the way, uh, I can understand the frustration of Tim Pooh. That is one, one part of the etiquette that the guest can breach a guest that goes on a rambling spree like i, I don't want to because i love i love him i love david duke okay love him he's a friend but david used to go on rambling sprees that i was like at this point i have to come in and protect the brains of my audience okay it's like shut up uh, let's try to structure the discourse here uh, it is extremely annoying, and I can understand, although I'm very critical of Tim tonight, um, Tim was in front of a situation that had its own annoyances to him, too, that were absolutely legitimate. This is a certain thing. When someone can't dress, you know that they're not like a fashion person. <laughs> they're just there as like... Now Kanye kind of bringing it in a high school style mockery. Ah, oh, you don't know how to dress, therefore you're, I know you're not in fashion, you're a CIA agent. I would have liked to hear more about this and more about how do we, what did she do? What did she want to do? Like the society, like the control that they try to use with celebrities, which has now been broken, right? Because you know where it broke? I know I'm, I, okay, I want to get on like LeBron in a second, but I'm going to come. See, he cannot help. We're we're already in a parenthesis of CIA agent Gab who dresses poorly. He's exiting that parenthesis and already on another parenthesis saying, oh yeah, we also need to talk about LeBron James. This is extremely poor delivery and people will end up thinking that you're crazy if you speak like this on the public space. Come back to this and just talk about this morning where, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention her name because she's a nice lady, but someone at Cohen Res Resnick tells me, and I tell my, all of my finance people never use the term a lot, but they said, okay, you're going to have to pay a lot of taxes. And that made me feel like they're just like waiting, like we finally got them. We finally can put them in jail. And I was like, can I still run for president in jail? I found out I could. So I was like, okay. Okay. So all this money shaking basically in his account leads to tax uh, responsibilities that he may not have predicted, that he may not have known about, and that sucks. That's them trying to put him in jail. It's like, he, 
they're trying to put you in jail because you have let them fuck with your money. You shouldn't let them fuck with your money and they they wouldn't have been able to try to put you in jail. Okay. Yeah. That's that's fine then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, be, it'll be okay. But, 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 but if you were if you were Jeffrey Epstein, they wouldn't touch your bank account. They would allow you to break the rules regulations just like JP Morgan and Chase did, just like Deutsche Bank did. So there is an issue to bring up with that. But when it comes to the race stuff, I think this is an important discussion to have because what, I think I, I have to I have to complete this thought. You guys gotta Okay, go ahead, go ahead. All right. Because I'm now Kanye is insulted because he doesn't get to finish his story, which was his big heart opening to him as an interviewer and as the staff beside him. They have to understand, OK, he's on a tangent here. You, you need to respect this, even if he's been rambling. Uh, you know, whoever I was inviting on my show, if it was David Duke, and if I could feel that he was on something that was very important to him. It didn't matter if it's rambling, if it's poor delivery, if ultimately it's not that important. The fact that he mentioned, this is me opening my art, you have to give him space. Tim has failed and his uh, co-host has failed here at doing it. I'm talking about literally finding out that they were trying to put me in prison this morning. Now Kanye has to justify, this is an emotional thing to me. And so please listen to me. He has to create space for his own. Now, it's a little bit narcissistic of his to think that this is somehow a new story or that people should care about this. But you have to play with what the guest gives you. And if the guest tells you this is very emotional to me, you have to respect it. Watch this. So This morning. Yes. So not, you know, not come to my house this morning, but I found out, okay, so they froze. The tension here builds. Tim Cass tries to look empathic, but as the half Asian that he is, he can't. And so Tim Cass is like, this morning, kind of showing some interest. But even that on a defensive brain that, can, that Ye is now in a position to be, because he's kind of feel the aggression from, from the staff on the side of him. Even that little branch of olive extension by Tim gets misinterpreted by Ye. And Ye starts saying, well, this morning, I mean, I found out this morning. They were not at my door this morning to arrest me. So on the defensive, you see, in the defensive move, mood of Ye, Tim Poole's attempt at extending empathy is interpreted as a judgment as a, and as something needing correction. And here you have a build up of the oppositional psychology between the two. Holy shit, I'm now speaking like Jordan Peterson. I have to stop. They put a $75 million hold on four of my accounts. And then they said, you owe a lot of taxes. Took me like six hours to find out how much a lot was. They said, <laughs> well, around $50 million. Now I'm going to different CFOs like, okay, so would this be tax evasion? Because I'm obviously not the most financially literate person on the planet. I was just a child, basically. Like when you become famous, you, you stop growing at that point. I became famous at age 24 and I had handlers around. I had my mom around different things. And it was always like you go from one handler to the next handler to the next handler. So now I'm having, I, I, I get to actually learn how to run a company. Very interesting insight here on the young star phenomenon. And it's true that you see these people uh, underdeveloped mentally. It's quite fascinating. And he explains the process here. It's that when you become that rich, that young, you just stop developing. Fascinating. Everything becomes so easy that you're not out there trying to be the best version of yourself. You're, you already have everything falling into your hands. BJB sends 15 bucks on Entropy. Thank you so much for the support. He says, Jeff, put in a fresh appeal on your Twitter. Seems they have some almost immediate automated restoration of accounts with the amnesty. Some members of TRS did this and got them back near instantly yesterday. 
All right. Well, I, I've actually refreshed my appeal uh, like one week ago or two weeks ago. But if you tell me that it could help to do it again, I'll do it again. I mean, th they stack those appeals. They say, oh, this was your old case. We're going to put it above uh, your old case. So I can stack another one. I don't mind. I'll try to do it uh, tonight. Thank you very much for the support. And yeah, hopefully this works. Autoritista says, hey, Johnny, Croatia and Canada were 4-1 in football. Did you watch the game? No. Actually, I was at the dentist and I may have seen the game accidentally because they were showing it on screen. But no, I don't give a shit about soccer, football. This, no. I get to learn how to... Uh you know, uh, to count really. I had, I was like Pablo in a movie. It was like, I didn't even know where to put the money, like literally making <laughs> $300 million cash. DK Shadow says, what do you call a handler that handles handlers? A meta handler. But you're just like a high priced, you know, we're not going to use the S word just cause it's just like too passe to use it, but it's like. I was wondering guys, because this is a part of the interview. <coughs> what, what, what was the S word that he was uh, talking about? Because I, I don't know. Maybe I just don't know English enough. Slut? Is it that he would be a slut? I don't know. Maybe you guys on the slave, slut. Okay, slut. That, that's the word. Uh, it didn't come to mind uh, when I was listening to the interview and I was actually wondering. Next, you know... Oh, maybe it was slave? The, the S word would be slave? Let's re-listen. Uh, you know, uh, to count... Really, I had I was like Pablo in a movie. It was like I didn't even know where to put the money, like literally making <laughs> 300 million dollars cash. But you're just like a high priced, you know, we're not going to use the S word just because it's just like too passe to use it. But it's like I priced slut. That would be slut. I don't think that slave works well here. Next, you know. Next year, I was supposed to make five hundred million dollars in royalties and like no one needs this amount of money. But when I would work on homeless shelters and ideas, I'd have a contractor, we won't say what race, um, <laughs> and <laughs> the, you know, they'd be tearing down the contracts. It's all about, you know, position. Well, uh, Crazy Catman says slave works better. A high-priced slave? Okay, but how is slave passy? Slut, I can see it being passy, but slave doesn't sound passy at all. And it's not about the amount of money that you have. And, you know, to come in here, I feel like it's a setup to be like defending. I'm not going to go through another like I'm literally going to walk the F off the show if I'm sitting up here having a. Now, out of nowhere, uh, apparently. He is already warning Tim. So, so the. The psychological accumulation process that I was talking about has really worn him out. And now he's at the limit. And he's warning Tim, I'm going to get the fuck out of here. If, and now he says, if I have to defend against anti-Semitism and that kind of accusation, basically. You know, talk about you can't say that it was Jewish people that did it when every sensible person knows that. I mean, John Stewart knows what happened to me and they took it too far. See, he's hanging on to the John Stewart commentary, which I highlighted as very important a couple of shows ago. Uh, he has understood that John Stewart was kind of an ally to. By, by saying we should open up the discussion and talk about these things, that he, he, guess, he guesses that John Stewart agrees with him. It was like American History X. Like my head was on the side of the curve and the exact people that I called out kicked my head. We found out that my trainer was a MK Ultra uh, Canadian. So he's invoking the, uh, the head on the, the, the curbing 
So he's invoking a very uh, black racial theme that is present in American History X and saying he was the victim of such such financial curbing, basically. Median uh, intelligence. He, was, uh, yeah. he worked in the defense research and uh, development uh, in the Canadian military, essentially working on PSYOPs Who's in this the guy? Canadian military. So here you see how Tim Pool comes and says, who's this guy? Insisting on pointing to the individual when th the whole thing about him is that he was a Jewish person with power around the circle of Kanye, who he has now qualms about. But you see this passive aggressive way in which Tim goes and says, Who's that guy? Like, please specify name of the individual, please. Like, I want to, I want to be able to ignore his race. Please tell me the name of the individual. It's kind of, it, it's, it's you, Tim. You, you are putting yourself at the front of a news that you don't be, you don't need to be, because here we have a delivery from Kanye's heart, and there you are caring about. Let, let's frame it as an individual issue. I want the name immediately. We know that you're not really caring for the news here. You're, you're caring already to shape the narrative against what your guest is trying to bring up. Military, this is Harley Pasternak. <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying is, look, they tried to medicate me. They, I was exhausted. They and, and that's, that's a technique we see often with Joe Rogan and... It makes me think about this when you write this spindly opinion. He writes, Tim was pretending he knows nothing as if he was born yesterday. And very often you have Joe Rogan, you know, and Joe Rogan, you kind of want to forgive him for this, but he's often like, oh yeah, Jamie, Google it. Not, I want to check if it's true. And typically he's, it's very well done with Joe Rogan. But here with Tim, it sounds like an escape from his obligation to prepare a show about Ye. You cannot expect that you're going to talk about anything else than the main subject that Ye has been in the, at the forefront of the news for, and you should be prepared. They diagnosed me, and they, 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 when I asked them, how much lithium did you want to put me on exactly? It took them four days to answer because they were embarrassed about the amount, right? And I refused to take this, right? You understand that if I had taken the medication, I would not be here and it would have been, whoa, was, he was deeply troubled. We miss him. We love his music, though. Well, they would have Britney Spears, too. So that is, that is why this is also important. It's that we have a human being here who could have been deprived of liberty and there wouldn't have needed to be much more happening. If he had done one decision bad or another, if he had given them too much power, if he had signed papers he didn't care about reading much, he, he was an inch away from losing his liberty. And we know this because we know the TMZ coverage years ago where they actually brought him to the psychiatric hospital. So it's not like it was empty threats in the air. They've done it. They tried it. And it worked for a couple of days, apparently. I mean, look at they what they were Michael Jackson. Or, or worse, yeah. So look, <laughs> guess, I guess what they did, look at what they did to Britney. When she went in, she was tired, she was exhausted. Yeah. She was and Michael Jackson is another interesting case to think about here apparently dying from drugs that he was taking for his stress and for um, sleeping. So he was habituated to drugs by the, this kind of half-illegal doctor who, who was a handler slash doctor, was capable of prescribing things in a, in a non-orthodox fashion, I would argue. He dies from it. And Kanye, instead of dying, it seems that they have attempted to lock him up in a psychiatric hospital. But why do we see this phenomenon so regularly? Why did they do it to Britney Spears?
it was in a bad way, but 10 years of that medication wrecked her brain. You can see it now. Yeah. You can see there's not much of her left. You, you mentioned Pasternak was the name? Uh, yeah. Yes, Harley Pasternak. That's the that's the uh, text message that you yes. posted that Here, we were talking about here, here's, before. Here's, here's, that's here's, the lobotomy. Let me, let me, you know. yeah. Before the show, obviously, I'm getting a bunch of messages from people. And people are hitting me up, and they're like, you shouldn't host them. They're anti-Semitic. They're right supremacists. They're racist. I do find the idea. Uh, I do find it funny or weird, or whatever. That you know, Nick, they call you a white supremacist. You're here working with or for you know one of the most powerful black men, one of the wealthiest and most famous. And amazingly, this is one of the most amazing thing in this interview, is that Nick Fuentes is there, but we don't get to hear him at all. <laughs> Nick Fuentes is in this freaking room. And yet he's silent, probably both because of his personal felt responsibility that he must leave Ye as the forefront man. That's understandable. But also it's a failure of them. You got Nick Ferrantes, you you can bring you can bring him, you, you can squeeze him for good content. It would be funny. But Tim here fails at making it an inclusive discussion. Because he's not, he, he doesn't understand this domain enough. He doesn't understand those arguments enough. But uh, a lot of people were saying on the right, specifically, don't platform them. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I want to. Uh, th wanna... This is the most ridiculous thing. And I've been hearing it lately when these podcast hosts say, oh, I can't have you. I've been asking to some people on the right about you and they have very bad things to say about you. They say, I shouldn't invite you because of this or that or this hit piece or that. And it's like, uh, the, the right is not a collective that acts in everyone's interest. We are, not a, we are not a single entity. If you ask someone else on the right, he's probably going to talk shit me because he wants the attention. He doesn't want Papa JF to get it. See? The biggest competitors are on the same side of politics. In many ways, uh, I don't care about what happens to Vouch, if I'm a right-winger, to Destiny, to whatever. I care about the other right-wingers who are potentially draining audience from me. So to, to ask to right-wing people, hey, can you recommend this right-wing guy or should I, should I not trust him? That is absolute leftist crap, mob social networking, exactly the kind of crap that we're here to denounce and that Kanye is here to denounce. You are doing trust by networking, by guilt, by association, and it's absolute crap, Tim. You have a responsibility to seek your own facts as a journalist, not talk to right-wing people and assume that you, get a, you will get the right-wing view on Kanye to understand what they're thinking and why they're thinking it they're part of they're involved in what may be the biggest news story of the past week and we have an opportunity to sit down and, and talk because the them. red media controls both sides it just said it as simple as possible jared kushner was next to trump ron emmanuel was next to obama but see, since it, 1940 go ahead i was gonna say isn't that an issue of these individuals like you, you're you're extrapolating i'm not having i'm going to get i'm going to order with the last of my money that's available in a different account, I'm going to order a PJ before I sit and have another Lex Friedman setup conversation when, when I'm literally trying. This is the second warning by Kanye. If you're here to catch me into a you can't say they're Jewish or you can't make a link between their attitude toward power and their collective identity, I'm going to be standing up and getting the fuck out. That is the second time Kanye says it. And they're trying to put me in jail for my opinion. But I, I'm I not, get that. I'm not and he's like, look at the size of what we're talking about. We're talking about me being imprisoned. We're talking about me being drugged to the point of, uh, of losing my consciousness and my intelligence. And you're worried about, oh, is the phrasing of the collective pointing that I do quite okay, or is it not okay? You're like, you haven't even empathized with my potential loss of liberty, and you want me to start caring about the fact that, oh yeah, they are technically Jewish, but I shouldn't say it? 
not going to have that opinion. I don't care about people. The peop, Those are bots that are trying to tell you. We realize, look at Pence. He sold Trump out. You get what I'm saying? It's like I would have never uh, wanted to do anything that hurt Trump. I'm on, I'm on Trump's side. Trump. So here, Kanye is confirming that his interpretation of what he's doing with the 2024 year 2024 is perhaps not in line with what Milo sees and perhaps not in line with what I see as a potentially good outcome. I see him hurting Trump and the Republicans, <coughs> and I see this as being beautiful. Milo sees a potential story of vengeance, although he hasn't fully stated probably because we didn't get a two-hour interview. Perhaps he would have otherwise, but up to now, I'm not sure. Vengeance against who? Vengeance against Trump or vengeance for Trump? But Kanye doesn't want to hurt Trump. He, he doesn't see this as being one of the only outcomes that his success could lead to. Trump said things that hurt me. He lied about me, but I mean, he's known for lying. And when people used to tell me that, you know, he's a liar, it's like, you know, I went into the trenches for Trump. That's another conversation. There was no one in my position that mm -hmm. wore that hat. And all of my surroundings exhausted me. It was like death by a thousand questions. I know I'm jumping to another thing. Yeah. But what I'm saying is I know you got a rep for your 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 people online, but it's no, like no, you no. got a person in real life that no. I I'm not with it, bro. I lost the I, I lost the money for the freedom of speech. And that's what makes me the only American that we know that really deserves to run the country because everyone else, your boy DeSantis, Trump, whoever <laughs> they 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 raise in a petri dish over on the Democrat side is is going to play the game. Look, look and, like, here, here's what I was trying to get yeah. to. I, 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 you went right into the anti-Semite thing. I think it's something that should be talked about. But it that is ridiculous. Given that at first I actually thought, OK, maybe Tim has a point here. But now that I've reviewed many times the interview, Tim brought it up. You put it on the wall. You, you sh show it to Kanye's face and you said it. So once you bring this up, uh, don't be surprised that he has to spend his day, his whole interview, uh, defending himself. But if you, if you start bringing this up, you're going to ask my opinion on it. I'm going to disagree with you. I and this is a beautiful moment because Tim has always been big enough and uh, he's always had guests that were not confrontational enough to tell him, shut the fuck up, I don't give a shit about your opinion. But he's about to get it because he just said, you're going to ask my opinion about it. Well, Ye has not given any sign that he would be wanting your opinion about it. So you're going to have to defend yourself with another wording because Ye doesn't give a shit. I didn't I, ask I, your opinion on it. You no, jumped but, into but, it. But I, but you, I don't. Boom. There you go. You have a billionaire. He doesn't give a shit about your opinion. So Tim here should have phrased it differently. He should have said, I want to give my opinion. It's important to me because it's my show. But he shouldn't have grounded it in a Ye's desire to hear him. Because surprise, surprise, Tim, your opinion isn't that interesting. You're just, you're just good enough to gather an audience that will not be too annoyed at your voice, and they will want to hear your very, very repetitive talking points on the everyday crazy leftism. That's all you've got. You don't have a particularly insightful take. You don't particularly do good research, as we can see in this interview. So your opinion, Tim, sucks. I don't care about your opinion. I like your opinion on how we win an election, but I don't care thing. about anybody's opinion. Bro, I lost. They tried to put me in jail. So very interesting. He doesn't care. The hurt to him was too big. And so he's going to feel that hurt no matter what Tim Pool thinks about it. They blocked two... Two billion dollars I had, like what I told Farrakhan, I said, look, oh, is it anti-Semitic for me to say his name out loud? Like, I, I the told minister. Yeah, <laughs> the minister. Like, I told Obama which, met, with him, met with him, too. Oh, he was, yeah, I mean, the uh, Jewish people allowed 
uh, Obama to meet with the minister. You know, so uh, Farrakhan said, well, did he have the money? The contract for the next four years, if I hadn't done anything, would have been $500 million a year for four years. What I was fighting for was the IP so my children could, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I just sometimes I think about seven thoughts at one time. Absolute rambling. Because anything I see, I come up with like seven answers to it and then just <laughs> choose what it is. These, he has to learn to cut out parentheses if he wants to be in the business of speaking to audiences. But, but I, when, the thing is, when I said my children, the reason why my, my brain kind of blocked, because it's like God is saying, you know, your, your children are going to be OK. The, you know, baby mama's got money, right? Now he's talking about his exes and the babies he have with them and they have enough money. That is completely uh, beside the point, parenthesis. I don't know how many levels of parenthesis we are in now. God is using me. He's breaking me down, removing all of the, you know, richest person, all of this. So I See, that's an emotional moment. You have to create a space in the interview. He's saying that God is tripping him of all these labels, this success, so that he can be more himself, so that he can be a better servant of God. You have to let this moment happen if you're Tim. I can serve him. And the more and more those things are taken away from me, the more I can be empty and be a vessel and be able to be used. And right now it's like, you're not gonna take, if, if we can't, you're not gonna take my pain away, right? The Jewish people say, it's the Holocaust, this happened, and you can't say anything about it. We can't take their pain away. Excellent point. Why is the Jewish people entitled to have things that are unquestionable? I mean, in Canada, they are unquestionable by law. If you were to question the Holocaust, you would get arrested and put in jail many years. Uh, why? Is it that this suffering justifies a shutdown of the debate, but that Ye wouldn't have the equivalent for his suffering, a capacity to say, look, this is so hurtful to me, this is so personal, I would like you to shut up and I'd like you to lay it out and not think about the, uh, the ways in which you can question my label, but understand my experience of suffering. Understand it in the way I feel it. Now, for me, for, for someone like me who's for debate and contradiction, contrarianism, I wouldn't demand such a thing. It's a big demand, but it's a demand you can do, especially legitimized here by the contrary example, which is that the Jews are demanding this kind of protection for some of their suffering, and we give it to them. So why wouldn't you give it to Kanye too? And this is not a debate environment. It's a new show. There's place for it. There, there's a way Tim could have let the space happen to Kanye's subjective experience of oppression. And if you have something to say against it, you, you can bring it 20 minutes later. You will often see me do it in debates where I leave the space for something to happen. And I'm like, 30 minutes later, I'm like, okay, I want to come back on this point because I haven't said what I wanted to say. Boom. Tim could have done this here and may have protected the, the continuation of the interview by showing this sensibility. Anyway, no one's going to denounce the fact that they tried to lock me up. That's what it, because every time I'm just holding stride. And here we have the build up to Kanye standing and leaving. Look at this, it's happening extremely fast, but it's very important what is said. So here Kanye is saying, you won't deny that they tried to lock me up. It's what happened. It's a fact. And it's like, I, didn't, I thought I was more Malcolm X, but I find out I'm more MLK because as I'm getting hosed down every day by the press and financially, I'm just standing there. And when, when I found out that they tried to put me in jail, it was like a dog was biting my arm. Emotional delivery. He felt it as a betrayal, a betrayal that gave him physical arm so much that he was disgusted at what was being pulled on him. 
he discovered these people will get to the point of putting an innocent man in jail just out of their ways of mishandling his money. And I, 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 I almost shed a tear, almost, but I still walked in stride through it. Yeah. I, I, think, I think they've been extremely unfair to you. I now, this is a failure of empathy. Extremely unfair to you is not enough. You're talking about forced imprisonment, false imprisonment. You're talking about psychiatrization. You're talking about forced lobotomization. All this being substantiated claims of Kanye. Like, he can show you the DMs of Henry Pasternak threatening him to basically lobotomize him medically and make sure that he never gets to see his children again or in some controlled environment. Those are massive attacks on Kanye's liberty to come here and say, they've been unfair to you it shows no sensibility it's like it's like you were it's like you were finding a victim of murder or someone who's someone who's an attempted murder was committed against them and it's like yeah they were unfair to you but <laughs> there's no such thing you have to empathize if you don't empathize you have to explain why you don't believe yeah here Perhaps Tim would have an alternative view. Perhaps Tim would say, you know, I think you're a little bit delusional on the prison stuff. I don't think they tried putting you in jail. But you have to explain this. You cannot say, oh, yeah, in general, they were unfair. This is the most robotic, non-empathic, non-human response you could think of. Even I, an artist, I'm offended. Who was they, though? We can't for, say they. For, and, and Kanye comes back to him right away. So, okay, they were unfair. I won't take issue with the lack of empathy here. But can we talk about they? Who are they? Who are they? And look at the interaction. This is what leads Kanye to stand up. Yes, Corporate can press. We? I'm not using the, I don't, I don't use the word as the, as the way I guess you, you guys use. I'm, I'm talking about. It is about them, though. Now, very subtle here. I'm not using the word as I guess what you guys are using it, the, the way you guys are using it. This is Tim authorizing the racist. Very important because Kanye is about to stand up in two seconds. Ah, oh, you know, I'm not like you guys. You and I are different people. You guys are the racist. So when you say they, I know what you mean. But when I say they, it's not racist because I talk about the corporate media. Now, that is, a, that is a, a slight being done to Kanye here, saying that the same word in my mouth is noble, but in yours is this noble, saying, I will contest your use of that word while using that word also, but it's okay when I do that because I don't have racist undertone to my statement. I meant really just the corporate media was unfair to you. Well, Henry Pasternak is not part of the corporate media. JP Morgan is not part of the corporate media. They, they tried not to, to, to soil the reputation of Kanye through media. He was talking to you about how they tried to get him in jail or tried to get him in psychiatric hospital. So you are totally beside the point in your empathy. And on top of it, you're authorizing your guest. You're saying there's us and them. There's you guys and then there's me. And I have rights to use words that you don't. Because I will assume that whenever you said they, you meant all Jews, each of them, all of them, not a single one excluded. But when I use they, it means corporate media, so it doesn't matter. So here, Kanye probably took this in, but what really was the last straw is that Nick Fuentes comes in and says, well, it's them. So why? why because I, I, will, I will rewind a little bit. Tim Cast will say it's not them. God is saying, 
you know, your, your children are going to be okay. The, you know, baby mama's got money, right? God is using me. He's breaking me down, removing all of the, you know, richest person, all of this, so I can serve him. And the more and more those things are taken away from me, the more I can be empty and be. Nancy Garcia has sent 10 bucks. She says, thanks, just wanted to help out. Thank you so much, Nancy, for the donation. Now, let's re-listen. This is interesting because it's when we will hear Tim say, no, it's not them. Be a vessel and be able to be used. And right now it's like, you're not going to take, if, if we can't, you're not going to take my pain away, right? The Jewish people say, it's the Holocaust, this happened, and you can't say anything about it. We can't take their pain away. No one's going to denounce the fact that they tried to lock me up. That's what, because every time I'm just holding stride and it's like, I didn't, I thought I was more Malcolm X, but I find out I'm more MLK because as I'm getting hosed down every day by the press and financially, I'm just standing there. And when, when I found out that they tried to put me in jail, it was like a dog was biting my arm and I, 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 I almost shed a tear, almost, but I still walked in stride through it. Yeah. I, I think I think they've been extremely unfair to you. I think. Who was they though? We can't say who they is. Corporate can we? press. I'm not using the. I don't, I don't use the word as the, as the way I guess you, you guys use. I'm, I'm talking. It is. And he looks at Nick Fuentes. You guys, the racist. And so he's looking at Kanye, Nick Fuentes. It's like, yeah, you know, you guys. When you use they, uh, we all know what you mean. Uh, and Nick Fuentes just said. It is, though. It is them, though, isn't it? I mean, because, <laughs> no. and, and because when you think <laughs> about it... Can... Now, in the background, we've heard Tim say, no, it's not. This will be the sentence that is too much for Kanye. Where Kanye has been repeatedly saying, I'm telling you that they were Jewish, the people who did this to me. I didn't say all Jews. I said, they are Jewish, the people who did this to me. And now Tim Pool just said, no, it's not. So Tim Pool is denying a fact here. Tim Pool is refusing a factual statement that is true. And he is diverging from his responsibility as a journalist here and using his voice to shape what he thinks should be the moral discourse, but around a fact that he doesn't have the goods to contest. Tim Pool cannot possibly agree with his own sentence here. What Tim Pool is trying to say, but extremely poorly, is trying to say it's not them because it's not all the Jews. But no one has said that it was all the Jews. That is not Kanye's claim. That is not Nick's claim. So Tim has made a false statement, and that is why Kanye will leave. Let's re-listen to that false statement. It is a denial that they were Jewish when, in fact, they are. I'm not using the. I don't, I don't use the word as the, as the way I guess you, you guys use. I'm, I'm talking. It is about them, it. though, isn't it? I mean, because <laughs> no, and, and because when you think <laughs> about not. it, no, it is not. When you have all of the facts pointing to the fact that the people who pulled this on Kanye were Jewish. Tim doesn't have any alternative facts, any alternative explanation than this. He doesn't have a proof that they weren't Jewish. So Tim is actively denying here reality. Now, Tim has his own leftist explanation and cognitive dissonance around this. What he means is it's not all the Jews. But since this was never put on the table, since this isn't a claim of your opponent, you are attacking a straw man, Tim. You are stating a false fact, and you are ultimately combating the truth on your own show. And therefore, Ye, feeling empowered by God and a mission of truth, feels that he is confronted with a non-journalist denying reality. And he's going to stand up right there.
No, it's not them. Look at this. A second later. Consider it. In 2018. What do you mean it's not? It, what, what do I mean? Like, uh, uh, what do you mean it's not? Uh, 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 what, what, what do I mean it's not? You just denied a fact. What do you mean it's not them? D do you mean I lie? Do you mean Henry Pasternak isn't Jewish? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, okay, so how about... Are you leaving? Are you afraid of the press? He's gone. I'll say it right now. And this passive-aggressive bitch, whoever that is, one of the people with bizarre hair on Tim's pool team, says, are you afraid of the media? What the fuck, man? Th this is the cheap knockoff that you had. I don't know who it was because it wasn't on video. But someone from Tim Pool's team sees a man walking away emotionally from a Tim Pool who was absolutely inappropriate throughout this interview. And all he finds to say, are you afraid of the media? <laughs> are you don't like questioning? Eh? <sighs> so small. So ridiculously small. I hypocrite sent five bucks, he says. Come on, Tim Pool L. Yeah, that was a, a lot of the people in the regular chat yesterday were saying, Tim Pool L. Tim, uh, what does that mean? Tim Pool lost? I guess it's what it means. Tim Pool as a failure. I fully agree. Thank you for the super chat. I hypocrite. And hey, I hypocrite, can I count on you to continue your campaign toward Elon Musk to get me back on Twitter? I highly appreciated being on your list of people that needs on banning. I am still not unbanned. And if you can deploy the best energy you got, that doesn't need to happen fast. It has to happen intelligently. I don't want you to get... Uh, accused of spamming or anything but if you can give a push anytime maybe this week or maybe next next week give a push to elon musk that i need to be back I, i'm a i'm a book writer i've been unfairly banned from twitter by the previous administration who are making up stuff the problem is they banned me for spam and i've never spammed so how do i prove that i've never spammed to Elon Musk, uh, he should just unban me and he would see that I don't spam. Six says, you should see the episode he's streaming tonight. Michael Malice on there with a Jewish armband. Non-stop Jewish jokes for the first half hour before I bailed. Are you serious? So he feels so, uh, he feels that he needs to give the balance. Holy shit, Tim. How far have they fallen? How far has the internet fallen? So that's it. I mean, we see Kanye step out. Uh, he was reported by the staff of Tim Lady that he, he left while taking a couple of cookies in the kitchen. They had those cookies. Apparently, Kanye would have taken more than his share. Maybe, I don't know if she specifies the number, but... Maybe he would have taken three or four cookies rather than two or three. And the, the, this is reported by the quartering. But by the way, the quartering coverage of this is absolute crap. Quartering doesn't understand at all what's happening here. Doesn't understand the slight being done to Kanye. And, and he's all like, like, like a lot of people on social media are like, bravo Tim Pool, like Blair White. I'm so proud to see you stand up to anti-Semitism, Tim Pool. And all of this is a lost opportunity for a discussion that, holy shit, we still have to work to get done. That is what's most disappointing with all this. It's the failure of American intellectualism toward, toward the audience. Uh, that was it for tonight, boys. Thank you for being with me. If you'd like to support the show, join the Patreon, join the Subscribe Star, support us on a monthly basis. I see a lot of people are sending in tips. After the show is done live, 
you guys are supporting us on Odyssey. That's super appreciated. Thank you so much for being here. Geo Bro says, yo, Jeff, before you go, do a summation en français, s'il vous plaît. Okay. The conclusion in French. Well, I, I actually haven't done a conclusion in English, so I will say that Tim Pool here has failed at multiple levels that have built genuine frustration in Kanye and Kanye having a short fuse to a certain extent, but also being justifiably hurt by these, these abdication of journalistic responsibility by Tim Pool. And the final one being so important where Tim Pool is denying a fact because he doesn't like the framing of this fact, which you should never do as a journalist. You should divide. You should say, all right, that is true, but uh, this, this other moral consideration should be taken into account when you phrase blah, 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 blah. Tim Pool didn't want to properly divide the moral and the facts here. He overstated his case. He stated, no, it's not when it is. And that's something you don't want to do as a journalist. Alors, en français, Tim Pool a échoué à ses responsabilités en tant que journaliste euh, en bâtissant une série d'insultes qui se sont accumulées, qui ont, qui ont mené à l'accumulation de frustration par euh, Kanye West. Et la dernière frustration était la plus importante lors de laquelle Tim Pool a nié un fait, nié un fait que tout le monde sait est vrai, que Tim Pool ne pouvait pas nier la véracité de ce fait, mais plutôt, il a décidé de nier par la morale. Il a décidé de dire, je vais nier ce fait parce que je n'aime pas ses conséquences morales. Tim Pool, ultimately, has broken the, the David Hume distinction between the morals and the facts, and he has let a moral preference of his invade his phrasing of the factual reality and hide reality. That makes him a terrible journalist and a leftist. Bye-bye.